Hello, everybody. Welcome. I'm really glad you could join us. I'm in the Henry Core Judaica Library at the moment. You can see oh, in the yeah. background our Holocaust collection, and it's pretty vast. And I have a little bit of background information on both Shira and Manfred before we start uh, the interview. Shira Leibowitz Smith Schmidt arrived in Israel in June 1967 to volunteer for the Six Day War, and she hasn't yeah. left. She's subsequently met and married the late Elchanan Leibowitz, son of Yeshayahu Leibowitz, and they raised their six children in Be'er Sheva. Shira has a Bachelor of Science in Engineering and a couple of master's degrees in urban and regional planning and in civil engineering. Her profession migrated from engineering to teaching engineering, to teaching English to engineering students, to translating and editing and writing articles. Her current profession gives her time to spend with her six children, her grandchildren, and her husband, wow. Baruch Schmidt. Many times when Shira pops into the library, she mentions an article she's writing or a person she interviewed for an article. And I'm delighted that now we can be part of one of her interviews. Manfred Goldberg was born in Kassel in central Germany into an Orthodox family. He and his family suffered escalating persecution in Germany under the Nazi regime in the years before the Second World War. Manfred's father escaped to Britain in August 1939, just days before the war began, but the rest of the family were unable to join him. The situation deteriorated following the outbreak of the war, and in 1940, Manfred's Jewish school was closed by the Nazi authorities. In December 1941, Manfred, his mother, and younger brother were deported from Germany to the Rigo ghetto in Latvia. Life in the ghetto was characterized by lack of food, use of slave labor, and constant fear. Throughout Manfred's time in the ghetto, the Nazis and their Latvian corroborators uh, regularly collected inmates of the ghetto for mass shootings in forests on the edge of the city. Despite this, Manfred was able to celebrate his bar mitzvah in March, 1943. In August, 1943, just three months before the ghetto was liquidated, Manfred was sent to a nearby labor camp where he was forced to work laying railway tracks. The prisoners in the camp were treated brutally and again subjected to frequent selections. As the Red Army approached Riga, Manfred and the other surviving prisoners were evacuated to Stutthof concentration camp <clears throat> near Danzig, Poland. He spent more than eight months as a slave worker in Stutthof and its subcamps, including Stolp and Burggraben. The camp was abandoned just days before the war ended, and Manfred and other prisoners were sent on a death march. Manfred was finally liberated at Neustadt in Germany on the 3rd of May, 1945. Manfred came to Britain in September, 1946 to be reunited with his father. After learning English, he caught up, and caught up on some of his mix, missed education, and he eventually graduated from London University with a degree in electronics. He is married with four sons and several grandchildren. Before turning the virtual microphone over to Shira and Manfred, I want to express my thanks to Elizabeth Dorfman for coordinating this lecture, Melissa Dubinsky for smoothly taking care of Zoom technicalities, Jacques Koralnik for lecture publicity, even at short notice, <clears throat> Shira Schmidt for suggesting Manfred as the ideal speaker for Yom HaShoah, and Manfred Goldberg for agreeing to speak and for sharing your story with us, and to all of you for your virtual attendance. Uh, Manfred. Uh, I'm here. Good morning. 
you were born in April 1930. The Hebrew date was the 23rd of Nisan. That means this past Sunday, you were 72. Mazel tov. Thank you. Uh, now, you were uh, eight. That makes you eight years old at Kristallnacht in 1938. Tell us about your childhood, your school, Jewish holidays, family. I, I do recall Kristallnacht. Let me just give you just a, a wee bit of, of background. Um, we lived in an apartment, in a small apartment block. There were, I believe, six apartments. There was only one other Jewish family in the block. The remaining four apartments were occupied by non-Jewish German families. One of them was a family uh, whose husband was a policeman, a civil policeman in, in, in the town of Kassel. And he was not a Nazi. He established a good relationship with our family, particularly my father. And if, a few days before Kristallnacht, apparently my father, Oliver Schollem, told me this only later, I didn't know at the time. Um, the two met on the staircase of this apartment block and Herr Dilling, Dilling was the family name of the policeman, um, told my father in a whisper that he couldn't be specific, but something highly unpleasant was going to happen and my father would be well advised to disappear for a while. My father took his advice to heart and actually did go into hiding. So on Kristallnacht, the only people in our apartment were my mother with us two children. I was age um, eight at the time and my little brother was four years old. Um, we could see from our window horrific scenes in the street below. Um, it was self-evidently a mob was led by uniformed men. It was mainly um, the, type, the, lot, the lot who were called the brown shirts, the SA. The SS were the really privileged um, formation who had to swear loyalty to Hitler. The brownies, the, the brown shirts, they were the tough boys of the Nazis and they led hordes of, of private residents through the streets. Whenever they came across a Jew, they attacked anyone who was unfortunate enough to be out that evening. Uh, many Jews were um, injured, some seriously, and unfortunately, some people actually died as a result. And whenever they came across uh, a job, a shop that was known as Jewish, the front windows would be smashed in, the shop would be looted, and if it was a large premises uh, standing in their own grounds, they would often be set on fire. The violence was not confined to business premises either. Hundreds of shoes were vandalized on that evening. There was one shul not far from us, from our residence, that is. Um, it, it was one we, we never set foot in. It was a reform shul with, which had um, an organ playing on Shabbat. But to the Nazis, it was a Jewish house of worship and it was vandalized on that night. And since it stood in its own grounds, eventually it was set on fire from our home, looking out of the window, we could actually see flames rising from it. And it was totally, totally destroyed that night. And hundreds of synagogues, large and small, but in the same manner, um, all uh, totally vandalized that evening. Very few synagogues survived this assault. And the height of irony was that days later, the German authorities fined the Jewish community collectively one billion marks for having caused the, this national damage. These are my recollections. I also remember the knock on our door and some of those brown-shirted um, SA men 
asked for my father. My mother said he's not here. They didn't take our word for it. They entered our apartment and searched pretty thoroughly. Um, of course, they did not find him. And in that manner, my father was spared being sent to a concentration camp because during the few days preceding and following Kristallnacht, the Nazis arrested around 30,000 Jewish men, not the families, just the men, and sent them to concentration camps, which had already been opened at that period. Personally, we were a religious family. In fact, my father's presence in um, Germany was a result of this. Um, in his family back in Poland, um, it was customary to send the sons to yeshiva aged 14. And my father indeed was sent to yeshiva in town north when he was 14 years old. As I said, my father was in yeshiva. After he'd been there for four years, he received call-up papers to serve in the Polish army. The army was quite well known for its virulent anti-Semitism. And my father told me that at that time he had payers. And for a, a from young man in that situation to join the army was practically equivalent to committing suicide. It would have been hell on earth for him. At one point, he managed to persuade the authorities that he was the wrong age for the call up. But when he received the second call up, there was no alternative. With, with his parents' blessing, he packed his peckle and made his way into Germany. And that is how he came to reside in the town of Kassel, where some of his friends had preceded him likewise when they were called up. So he had some contacts in Kassel. That's why he settled there. Eventually, he was introduced to a young lady from, from home and they married in Kassel, where I and my little brother was born. I was born in 1930. I remember as a little boy, even before I began school, every Shabbat morning, walking with my father to, to shul on Shabbos morning, usually hand in hand, and he would tell me stories all with Jewish content. Eventually, I was, my father incidentally, dubbed in a, a Polish run Stiebel. There were two distinct Kehillot in Kassel. The majority of Jews were German born, who were all, with very few exceptions, um, sort of not particularly um, observant. And they disliked the Polish Jews who were known as the Ostjuden, because they were too from, and as far as the German Jewish community was concerned, that they were rocking the boat for them, they were recognizably Jewish. As a result, that was a different social circle for Ostjuden. As I said, my father went to a minion which was founded and run by Ostjuden. Practically all our friends were of similar background, Polish born, and that, that was our life in, in Kassel. We, we had uh, traditional Friday nights. I remember being taught Zmirot by my father, Kiddush, etc. It was a normal, traditional Jewish life. And so were our friends. We, we mixed it in that circle. Now, Eventually, I was um, enrolled in the only Jewish primary school in Kassel. That was the one thing that the German Jews and the Ost students shared. Every Jew was permitted to send their child to the same school. That was the only sort of social mixing. I began attending school, but before my ninth, or just around my ninth birthday, no, no, sh shortly after, before my 10th birthday, um, the Nazis issued an edict closing all Jewish schools and expelling all Jewish children who attended non-Jewish schools. So from that day on, 
There was no further education for any Jewish child. Eventually, of course, we were sent to the camps and of course that there was no education as such in the camps. I will tell you a little about this later on at the more appropriate point in our interview. But these are my vague memories. I, I, I remember having friends all of, um, sort of off student background. I remember we were friendly with one, just one, um, traditionally long settled family in Kassel of German Jewish background who were a very religious family and that, that, that we were on the same wavelength. I even remember their name, their name was Katzenberg. Um, and um, we became genuine friends. In, in fact, when I arrived in the UK after our liberation, um, that there were members of the Katzenberg family in living in London. And we restarted our friendship post Holocaust in the UK eventually. Until quite recently, I remember still using um, a Shabbos Challah knife, which was presented to us on our wedding by a member of the Katzenberg family. Um, you, Zippy mentioned that your family was separated, the family members got separated. Can we were, we were indeed. Although my father escaped um, the roundup at around Kristallnacht in early 1939, my father was arrested. And although he had left Poland more than 20 years earlier, and had renounced his German nationality, Polish. his Polish nationality. Um, the, Poles, the, the Germans, the Nazis arrested him, decided he was Polish after all, and we deported him to Poland. The Poles considered him a deserter because he had not served in the Polish army, sent him back to Germany. And after they'd played sort of football set for several times, the Nazis sending him to Poland and the Poles sending him back, Eventually, the Nazis said that if the Poles will not accept him, he would be sent to a concentration camp. This was mid-1939. My mother, Olea Sholem, very courageously um, contacted the Nazi office and pleaded for my father's freedom. They told her that the only possibility of avoiding concentration camp was that if he could show a visa, an entry visa to another country, they would permit him to leave Germany. But visas were more precious than gold dust. Every Jew in Germany was clamoring for a visa. And as I believe you, you almost certainly all know, um, all countries had more or less tightly closed borders. A few had annual visa quotas, but even then they made it unbelievably difficult to obtain one of these life-saving visas. So she was really knocking at closed doors and after many refusals, um, she finally went to the British consulate in Berlin and Kodesh Baruch granted her to tell her story to the chief passport officer who was a, a British goy who was actually a spy for MI5. And this passport position in the consulate was his cover for his spying activities. And unknown to the British government, this man was actually an Ohev Yisrael. And he established um, sort of a, a, a silent, very secretive lifeline to save Jews. I have since learned that this gentleman whose name was Frank Foley, um, has served, saved in excess of 10,000 Jewish people during his period in Germany. And he has been granted um, the title of righteous Gentile by Yad Vashem. But during his lifetime, no one knew about it. All this came to light only post-war. But when my mother told him her heartbreaking story, he gave her a single visa, permitting my father to enter the UK but he said he was under such pressure that he could not help the family at that moment. He asked us 
to be patient and in a matter of six to eight weeks, he hoped to be in a position to issue visas to my mother for us three to follow my father and be reunited in, in the UK. My father was very reluctant to leave us behind, but my mother kept encouraging him, consoling him, saying do need separation for a few weeks. And he finally left because the Nazis issued an ultimatum saying that un unless he left within 24 hours, they would cancel the deal of allowing him to leave and he would end up in a concentration camp. So he, I remember us walking him to the railway station and he hopped on the train and made his way to the UK. And unfortunately, two weeks after his departure, the Second World War began. And of course, Germany and Great Britain were now at war. And our dream of being reunited in a few weeks or days even um, was shattered. We were now trapped in Germany. And that was the beginning of a seven year separation. Then uh, I guess your first stop was uh, the ghetto in Riga. Can you That's tell right. us about life there, daily life and special? Uh, life was extraordinarily difficult after the beginning of the war. <clears throat> Jews were being persecuted, of course. We had to wear yellow stars on our outer garment. <clears throat> if we walked in the street and any uniformed person came towards us, we had to step into the gutter to allow that person to leave before we could remount the pavement. We were not allowed to shop in any non-Jewish shop and all the Jewish shops had been destroyed and closed. There was just one shop we were permitted to do our purchases. But although life was very tough, my mother managed, we had to live on our savings, of course. My mother managed to look after us children. She even attempted I, I recall give, to give me some private lessons. She was not a qualified teacher, but she, she did her best. And eventually in December 41, we were arrested. My mother was told she had 10 minutes to pack a suitcase and then accompany these Nazis who had come to arrest us. They walked us to the railway station where we met up with a large crowd of Jews, each one with a suitcase. Eventually, it swelled to around 1,000 Jews. The total population, Jewish population of Kassel was around 5,000. And that day, 1,000 of this group had been arrested. We were packed into a train and set off on a journey into the unknown. After three days of traveling, we were ordered to get out. We found we were now surrounded by armed guards who formed us into a long column and they marched us or walked us into the town of Riga and we were housed in the ghetto in Riga. The Nazis had occupied Riga around uh, June, July, 1941. They established this ghetto within weeks and then ordered all close to 30,000 Jews living in Riga to vacate their homes and resettle inside this ghetto. The ghetto was um, quite a small area of old Riga town surrounded by a huge barbed wire fence. The Riga Jews had to settle in there and only months later, around November of that same year, 41, the Nazis carried out a major massacre. They lied to these Riga Jews, telling them that they would be moved to another camp. And in groups, they marched them to what the Jews assumed would be the other camp. Instead, they marched them into a nearby forest called the Rumbula Forest on the outskirts of Riga, where by using slave labor and prisoners of war, the Nazis had prepared three enormous deep pits. And as each group of Jews approached, they were murdered by machine gun fire and they either fell into or were thrown into one of these pits, regardless of whether they were dead or injured. And I, I have read accounts that when finally earth was thrown over them, it, 
still heaved because Jews were still buried alive. These three mass graves are still situated in the forest. Now they have memorial plaques on them to commemorate this atrocity. The ghetto was now empty and within days, transports of Jews from Germany like ours arrived in Riga and we were housed in the same accommodation that had been vacated by the Riga Jews <clears throat> when they were led to their deaths. When they were marched out to be murdered, they were not allowed to take any belongings with them. So when we arrived, being housed in the same accommodation that was vacated by them, we found all their belongings. We were initially quite puzzled by it, but very, very quickly, we were told of this atrocity because what the Nazis had done, they had spared 30 Latvian young Jewish young men. And the reason for their survival was A, that they were young and strong, and B, even more importantly, they were very fluent German speakers. And these 30 Jewish men were then appointed as internal camp police over the Riga ghetto. They became known as Kapos, abbreviation for camp police. And they had no real power, but they did have the powers of to keep peace between Jews if there were internal disagreements or arguments that, that they could intervene. And it was they who were, of course, eyewitnesses to, to this atrocity, told us what had happened. And hence, I'm in a position to tell you categorically, hearing it from survivors, what happened. In fact, that this atrocity is substantiated, the details of it on, online. We immediately were put on a starvation diet. We were all assembled and addressed by an SS officer <clears throat> who told us that from now on, we no longer possess names. And each one of us was allocated a number. And we had to remember this number. Unlike Auschwitz, the number was not tattooed on us. We had to remember it. And it was important to remember because we had to use it very frequently. And if by chance you, you got a little confused and you gave a wrong number or couldn't remember your number, very often it, it had um, consequences. As a rule, the SS officers, not so much the guards, but the officers walked around accompanied by a Jewish inmate who had been, uh, I don't know how to put it because it, it seems unimaginable to me, but had become assistant to the SS officers. They began, the SS began to trust them and they walked around with a whip in their hands and if an SS officer challenged you and you gave the wrong number, he often would instruct his trustee to whip you, give you a few lashes of the whip. So as you can imagine, we all did our very best to remember our number. I, I, I can recite my number to you now, I'll never forget it, 56478. And from that day on, that is how I was identified. There is documentation of me being transferred from one camp to another and always accompanied by that number. Sometimes on that sheet, there was my number and also my name, but that was the only time it was used to, to double identify us. He told us, apart from losing our names, that we had seven days to hand over all our valuables and any money we possessed, otherwise, um, we would be shot if caught with any. He also told us that all adults over the age of 13 would be organized into work groups who would have to labor in factories. But under 13, you were exempt from work. In practice, this meant that my mother had to go out to work every day. She worked in a factory manufacturing um, army, army uniforms. 
other people worked in factories producing um, armaments, bullets, pistols, even parts for airplanes were manufactured in some of these factories. I believe in one of the camps, they had to work in an underground factory manufacturing wings for airplanes. And we found out that these various factories didn't happen to be there by chance. The Nazis persuaded huge industrial combines in Germany to erect factories close to many camps. There were factories close to practically every large camp in, in Poland, Lithuania, etc. And they made it worth their while by promising them unlimited supplies of slave labor. And as a result, these Nazi industrialists put up factories in which we now have to work entirely or exclusively producing goods to support the German war effort. My job was to look after my little brother. By 1941, I was aged 11, he was seven. So I had to sort of entertain him. Of course, we were also, from the day of our arrival, put on a starvation diet. And that continued relentlessly, without interruption, for the duration of our incarceration between 1941 and 1945. So, of course, my brother, my little brother was hungry. All I could do was uh, read him a story to di divert his mind from, from craving for, for food. The Nazis also, rather cruelly, um, issued an edict that it was strictly, but strictly forbidden to bring any food in from outside at work. Some people bartered some of their possessions for food <clears throat> and then brought it back into the camp. More than likely, families who, who had children in the camp brought in some food to help their children get by. And to enforce this edict, the Nazis periodically took out at random one or two people from one such group returning from work. And I distinctly remember my little brother and I would run to the gates early to await my mother's arrival from work. And when we got there early, we sometimes witnessed the arrival of an earlier group. And on one such occasion, we saw two people taken out to be body searched and some food was found concealed on a lady and she was there and then lined up against the wall and shot. And that was how I witnessed my first violent death, aged 11. Was there After any bright spot, uh, uh, Manfred, was there any bright spot in, in Riga? Or any, any what? A bright spot. So you were 12 going on 13. Yes, but once I passed by, well, I'll, I'll tell you what happened. Youngsters like us who were left alone during the day to fend for themselves, not infrequently got into trouble one way or another. There were guards patrolling the ghetto during the day. And in fact, I, I myself, um, thought at one point my last moment had come. Um, I handed my younger brother over to a friend and I with another friend um, went to the part of the ghetto which was still open. We were one of the early transports coming to, to Riga. Um, we went into the empty part, got into a house and found some potatoes. So we carried out of a half full sack of potatoes loaded it onto a sledge we had found because there was still snow and ice. It was sort of a Russian winter, we were close to the Russian border. And as we did this, as we looked up, we suddenly saw a guard pointing a gun barrel at us. He had spotted us. And I can tell you that although it was a German concentration camp, more than 90% of our guards were Latvian Nazi volunteers. 
with the Nazis trusted sufficiently to let them handle a gun and they wore a special uniform. And those were our guards. The officers were all German SS, but the guards were um, Latvian. So, of course, our hands went up, we began crying, begged him to spare us and said we were not thieves, we were hungry. Well, after what seemed an eternity, during which both my friend and I thought we had to say Shema, um, eventually his, he, his face broke into a grin and he lowered his gun, all without saying a word, and motioned us to go and even allowed us to take that sack of potatoes with us. But of course, we never repeated that. But as a result of such incidents, there was one gentleman who was deported with our group. His name was Herr Bacher. I think of him as a saint. He was a teacher. He was a teacher in the Jewish primary school, which I had attended, and he was deported with us to Riga. He apparently had worked very hard with the Jewish Judenrat in Riga uh, to permit him the use of one room to which he could invite all the children from Kassel um, so that he could teach them just orally from, from memory. He was a bright teacher and eventually he was granted this request and we were requested each day to assemble with Herbacher in this room. He initially divided us into various age groups, not yearly, but every three years or so into a group. And he attempted to teach us just from memory. He had no facilities for teaching. Um, and it didn't work very well because when he got to the more senior ages, the, the, the younger ones uh, became a bit unruly and interrupted. So he realized he wasn't getting far but he was a resourceful and uh, a caring and a very able man, and he had musical knowledge. So what he did was something really clever. He formed us all from the youngest to age 12, which was 13, we had to go to work, into a choir. And he began teaching us uh, Hebrew melodies from our tefillot you know, like Adon Olam, Martovu, <clears throat> Yigdal, um, the Tzadik Katomov uh, part of Ms. Moshe Leona Shada. And it, 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 that really worked. He had everyone's attention and eventually he became ambitious and he formed us, subformed us to harmonize with each other. And it uh, really kept us occupied. And shortly before the adults were coming home from work he would allow us to, to leave and one day after my 12th birthday he came up to me and he said Manfred you know you, your 12th birthday has passed your bar mitzvah is approaching um, I know your father would normally deal with this but I know your father is not with you would you like me to help you prepare you for your, your bar mitzvah I wasn't really too sure what, what he meant by preparing me, but I was a, a good boy, which was witnessed by, by my um, sort of annual uh, school reports. <laughs> and uh, I said, yes, please, Herr Bacher. And he began teaching me what he had calculated. He didn't have a luach. He had to mentally try and project what would be my bar mitzvah parsha? And he decided it was uh, Shabbos parsha Tzav. And he began teaching me laning from that parsha. And once he realized that I picked it up very quickly, he began expanding, teaching me more, more than just, just Shlishi or Shishi. Um, and eventually he taught me that the whole parsha of Tzav. And he also thought that was mistakenly that it was Shabbat Parshas Para. So he taught me some extra laning, which was from Parshat Chukat, and he taught me the Haftarah from Parshas um, Para. And I, of course, happily went along with everything he did for me. And on the Shabbat, 
miraculously, I don't know how he did it, because every adult, every able adult had to go out to work daily, in, including Shabbat, we worked seven days a week. Um, he managed to produce nine adults, including himself, and I was very proud to be counted as number 10 for the first time in my life. Believe it or not, we had the Sefer Torah, because when the Riga Jews were compelled to move into the ghetto, they were allowed to take a fair number of possessions with them into the camp. And of course, many of them must have been Rabbonim from different uh, Poteknesset, with 30,000 Jews living in Riga, there must have been dozens of shuls. And many of these rabbis, what would they take with them as their most precious possession? The Sefer Torah. And if, when they were led into the forest to be murdered, all these possessions were left behind. So we found Sifrit Torah, Chumoshim, Agodas, um, Gemorahs, you name it, and it was all left behind because there weren't 100% from, but there were many religious families among them, and everything they brought into the ghetto was left behind. So he managed to get hold of the Sefer Torah, in which he allowed me to practice as well before uh, the day of the Bar Mitzvah, but on that day, we had a normal Shabbat service and I laid the whole parsha, and I recited the Maftir as well. There was no reception, no kiddush, I must tell you. That's about the only humorous bit I, I can think of in retrospect in the camp. Apart from that, there was nothing to laugh about. And that indeed was my Bar Mitzvah. And I do not know of, of any other person, either from the castle transport or at any other time during my years in the camps, having this experience. And this particular Shabbat um, was my only religious experience in three and a half years of incarceration. I was never ever aware of, of another minyan. There may have been secret minyanim organized by some from people, maybe secretly in someone's house, like they did, I think, in, in Russia when it was forbidden to um, congregate. But I think that was all done just sort of still a height, and, and I knew nothing about it. That was my only experience in Riga of... Um, uh, uh, Manfred, service. you have some slides. Maybe we could see some slides and then go ahead to the next part of your... Uh, ordeal, the yes. next camps. Okay, well, the, the, the slides we have are uh, one, is it the map? Can, can, can we please have a quick look at the map? For this, we are very grateful to Shira. I had a primitive map, but she has actually highly improved on it by showing the locations of the various camps I was in. The first camp, you see top right, Riga. Bottom left, you see the town of Castle. And the distance between Castle and Riga is about 1,000 miles. So they schlepped us 1,000 miles to house us in the Riga ghetto, where what I have told you um, transpired. That is where I had my bar mitzvah in March 1942, no, 43, I was th 13. Not many months later, in August 1943, we were taken by cattle truck to another camp. We had no idea where it was, and it turned out to be Prechu, this one here, which was very near to Riga. Although we spent two days in cattle trucks because the Germans gave priority to military traffic they had to send all their reinforcements and supplies to their front line by rail. So there was a lot of military traffic. And our train was sh shunted into sidings ever so often for lengthy periods to allow their military traffic priority. So it took us two days to cover this short distance. We were ordered out and we found ourselves in a purpose-built labor camp. It was 
an area on, a, on the edge of a forest which had been cleared and surrounded by, again, a barbed wire fence. And all that was within this area was a number of very large barracks, wooden, wooden built barracks. And these barracks contained from end to end bunk beds, three tiers high. And in this camp, a bunk bed became one's home. That was all one possessed. One slept in the same bunk bed every night. Being a labor camp, everyone had to labor in order to stay alive. I was then 13 and I was selected to become part of a labor gang uh, who were marched out of the camp daily to a nearby very busy rail junction, which the Allies had begun bombing because they realized its importance to the Nazis. All their military traffic taking supplies to the fighting front had to pass through that complex junction, apparently. So the Allies tried to disable it to disrupt uh, supplies to the German fighters. And we, a group of 300, were divided into the different work groups. And it was our job to dig up the bomber damaged rails, level the ground. Another group had to carry the re new replacement rails from the storage to the bomb site of whom I became a part. Groups of six of us had to lift one of these long rail lines onto our shoulders and we then had to carry it to the place which had been bombed where it was needed. Because this was quite a distance and it was all outdoors, they had posted Nazi guards along the route to stop anyone thinking of escaping. And they had devised a sadistic entertainment for themselves. They had armed themselves with long wooden sticks into the top end of each stick. They had hammered a sharp nail. And as we passed by carrying this heavy load of a rail, they would lash out at us to make us run instead of walk, telling us we weren't working fast enough. And some people were quite severely injured. I got away relatively lightly. I have scars to this day on two of my fingers where I sort of tried to shield myself from being lashed at with these naily sticks. And instead, they lacerated skin on my fingers. That, so that you and your true. mother and brother are in, in number three in Preshau. Yes, my, my, my mother, Lea Scholem, was in the same work group. She was digging, uh, le leveling the ground and helping to relay new rails while I was part of that group transporting rails. And your brother? Eventually I was transferred and I was, I, I, I was working in, in, in a small foundry which had been established on that site because some parts which were required for the repair were not standard, so one-off parts which had to be actually manufactured in that foundry. And I was transferred into that foundry. There were two or three um, Nazi guards watching us. I was allocated to someone who was quite experienced and he showed me what I needed to do. I learned pretty quickly and soon I was allowed to work on my own. And I'm not, I'm not sure whether it's appropriate to go into this now, but I can tell you about the one um, totally, but totally unexpected kindness was shown to me. I told them there were two or three guards, and one of them in particular um, never spoke to us. He always yelled um, very unpleasantly and frighteningly. And yet one day while I was working, he caught my attention and he indicated to me I should look into a particular drawer. And when I had an opportunity and did so, I found there was a sandwich in there. Of course, I grabbed it and gulped it down. And uh, 
so very discreetly indicated my gratitude and he repeated this several times but then quite extraordinarily one day he sidled up to me and he said i can see you're quite good at what you're doing and um, i would be happy if you'd make me a little pocket knife so i uh, can you say that a little what I, I wasn't permitted to do anything Pardon? Jimmy, he asked you to make a what? Is that a pocket knife? A pocket knife, yes. So a little pocket knife with, with a blade which you can sort of fold back to, into its holder. Um, I, I did the best I could, um, actually, sort of discreetly, illegally, not to be caught, manufacturing this. And I managed to finish it and actually put it into that drawer for him to find. And of course, I got my sandwich again, and it was heaven as far as I was concerned. And alas, it did not last long. Um, he must have been transferred. I don't think he was caught doing it. I think he was just transferred elsewhere. And that was the end of my honeymoon there. Oh. You want to see the other pictures? Pardon? You want to see the other PowerPoint pictures? The, the other pictures? Yes. You and your well, brother? I can tell you that the Germans had more than one way of eliminating people who, in their view, didn't earn their keep. One was um, mass selections. They're short of time, so I, I will leave that for later. But in addition, um, the guards who escorted these groups to these factories stayed with us all day long and they were sort of alerted to keep their eyes wide open watching people at work and if they discovered that someone had been weakened by their starvation diet or for some other reason but disabled in some way or feeling sick and did not work as effectively as efficiently as was expected in return for this starvation diet, then that person would be tapped on the shoulder by one of these guards and asked to walk with them to what became known as an execution site, where they would be shot and their body thrown into a mass grave. But this became known, so people resisted. Who, who would want to walk voluntarily to, to the violent death. So my next image shows you a photograph. Um, this must have been taken by one of the guards um, of what happened if you refused to walk to your death. These are Latvian soldiers, you can see Latvian soldiers. What I mentioned earlier, our guards being Latvian Nazis. Um, they would just in this manner drag them to the execution site. But the man you see being dragged here probably within half an hour of this photo being taken, was no longer alive. That was one way of filtering out people who no longer had the strength to give a solid day's work in return for a starvation diet. Did, did you witness this? Did you see people being dragged? I did, in, in this camp, I did not, because I was not working in the factory. I was working outside on the railway lines. But my mother would have witnessed this. She was working in a factory. And then from there, you went to Stutthof? Uh, uh, in, in this camp of Prechu, um, I would like to tell you of, of one of the most tragic things that happened to us. I told you my little brother was seven when he was taken into the camp. By now it was 1943 and he was nine years old. And he and three other young children were permitted to stay in the camp. Everyone else had to go out working. It was a labor camp and you had to labor. But these four children were given permission to stay in the camp. And each morning we had to leave them behind. And when we returned from work, we were reunited. One day we came back from work and these four children could not be found. 
after desperately trying to find them, a member of the kitchen staff who was one of a handful of people who were permitted to stay in the camp. They were working in the um, kitchen uh, barrack, preparing some food for us on our return from work. He told us the two SS officers had come into the camp that day, had taken these four children away. And to this day, we have had no closure. At the time, of course, there was no provision for, for mourning or inquiries. The next morning, my mother, Olea Sholem, and I had to get up, stand to, to attention, to be selected for work, as though nothing had happened. It, in order to stay alive, you had to labor. Post-war, we spent, of course, much time and effort contacting various organizations who had access to records, but we have not found any trace. The day these children were taken, apparently they disappeared off the face of the earth. Do you have a picture of him? Do you I have, have a, a picture, picture of, of him, which I will show you in my next um, um, Uh, the one following this one. Um, so here we are. This is my little brother on the right, and uh, I'm on the left, rather cheekily sticking up my tongue. Here. <laughs> so to, 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 to this day, I post war. I, I can tell you quite, I was probably naive, but I felt sure that a miracle had happened and he somehow had survived. And then I very, very occasionally read about two brothers who each thought the other had died. It, some, by some miracle had found each other. Um, I thought, well, if it can happen to them, why not to me? And I kept hope alive. For years, I was living in hopes, but of course, hope dimmed over the years. And it was many, many years before I finally sort of had to be honest with myself and admitted to myself that odds on, my brother was no longer alive at the end of the day that he was taken away. The Nazis had no use for non-productive Jews, as I've indicated to you when you saw that man being dragged from not being able to work efficiently. But life had to go on. We, we, we continued working in that manner. My mother had always drilled into me that, of course, she, she was as helpless, powerless in the camps as everyone else. She couldn't really shield me, help me, but she always drilled into me be as good behaved as you can. Do the best if you're given any job. Do it to the best of your ability. Try not to draw attention to yourself. Be, not being noticed was the safest thing in the camp. But I, I took that on, on board. That the, the only positive help she, she could give me to try and behave in that manner. So we had been in this camp for almost a year when one day no one was going to work and they marched us in groups into a nearby hall. And this is the major way in which the Nazis filtered people out who they felt were not giving them value for, for, for keeping us alive. Um, in this hall, on this occasion only, we were ordered to strip naked. Other selections were just taken into a hall and uh, selected clothes. And in this one, we were stripped naked. We had to line up single file, both men and women. There was no separation, mixed, both naked men, naked women. And we had to shuffle forward, single file, to the end of the hall, where each one of us stood in front of an SS officer. He would glance at the person in front of him and without saying a word, usually, he would just cursorily glance 
and then point left or right. There were two exit doors to that hall, and depending on whether he said right or left, you had to go by that, leave the hall by that respective door. As we were shuffling forward, the man immediately behind me in line, naked like I was, I didn't know who he was, never seen him before, he leaned forward, and although we were not allowed to converse, he sort of whispered to me, if he asks you your age, say you are 17. That's all he said. It was dangerous to speak. And indeed, as though that man had had Ruach HaKodesh, as I stood in front of the SS man, that is the question he asked me. And as I had been prompted, I replied, 17. And he pointed me in the direction of those who were spared and had a good chance of staying alive at least until the next selection or some other mishap. I have thought about this man periodically, many times after the war. And I, not infrequently, come to the conclusion that he was a malach, an angel in disguise who had been sent to save me. I would not have had the, the resource to say 17. And I found out later, I didn't know that at the time, he must have been more experienced and known something, that the Nazis indeed considered people aged 30, 17 and over to be um, profitable slave laborers. Under the age of 17, it was touch and go whether he would allow you to live or not. But about 17, you had a good chance of being allowed to survive that selection. And I don't, I'll never know what would have happened had he not given that advice to me. I never saw him again. He was behind me. I have no idea whether he was selected to live or die. That was just a one-off exchange of a few words, which so, uh, can we, uh, Manfred, could we skip to uh, Stutthof and the other uh, additional camps? Because we want to get eventually to the liberation and okay. Uh, yeah. Yes, I can tell you that very shortly after this selection, incidentally, we never got our clothing back. We were um, issued, if you show the next slide, it illustrated um, with the convict clothing, which became standard in, in the camps, striped gray and blue clothing. The next photo after this one, this one. Um, we were given this type of clothing, and that was the war from that day on until the day of liberation. The uniform we had been given never left my body. It was never changed, never washed, never cleaned. I wore it 24 hours a day for work, for everything else, sleeping in. And that, that was our fate. Once our shoes had worn out, or I had, I had outgrown mine, we were not given shoes, we were given wooden clogs, which we had to wear. So within days of that selection, we were packed into cattle trucks again, and we were sent to Stutthof concentration camp. If you show the next slide, please, you will see the main entrance gate to Stutthof which was known then and is known to this day as the death gate, because once you entered Stutthof as a rule, there was a slim, very slim chance of leaving alive. So passing through that gate was practically a death sentence. We became the envy of Stutthof, this group of 300, when it became known that we were in Stutthof in transit that we were on our way to be sent to another camp. And indeed, some people in Stutthof, like in every other camp, um, there was uh, a sort of um, different madrigas of inmates. Jews were usually at the bottom. And in Stutthof, there were also criminals and even murderers, homosexuals, gypsies, all sorts of mixture. And some of them had worked their way up within the internal uh, regimen of, of the camp, 
And some of them actually attempted to substitute themselves into our group to get people left behind in Stuttgart. And they wanted to substitute themselves to, to have the chance of leaving Stuttgart alive. Um, I don't know whether anyone succeeded, but certainly the majority of the group were carefully counted that name that same number that entered Stuttgart as that slave labor group was sent on to the next camp, which was Stolp. There, again, we were housed in a camp with a part wire fence, and our group of 300 was sent out to do exactly the same work as we had done before. It, the camp was also near a very busy railway junction, which was being bombed by the Allies, and we were used as a repair gang. We spent five months there, I think, doing this work. Same starvation diet. There is one incident in this camp, which I'd like to tell you about briefly. I, 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 I'm sorry, I, I'm speaking too detailed and taking too much time. In this camp, um, again, there was a lot of traffic going through, a lot of military traffic, and some of these military trains would stop there, and they got busy uncoupling wagons from one train, coupling it onto another train, all sorts of activity, which sometimes took hours. And occasionally, a train would actually stop for the whole night and would only move on the next morning. And the rumor began going around the camp that some of these wagons contained food, which was destined for the soldiers at the front line. And one evening, a group of inmates actually forced, broke the seal on one of these wagons and found some food. And of course, being on starvation diet for, for years, they grabbed some food and helped themselves. The Nazis, of course, were very upset at um, one of their edicts being disobeyed. And they came into the camp and took away eight people who they claimed were the people who had done it. Almost certainly they were just taken as hostages. And instead of dealing with them in the normal manner, which was just murdering them, instead, they organized the erection of a huge gallows in the camp. And one day, we were ordered not to go to work. We all had to assemble around this gallows and had to watch these eight people being hanged, not en masse, one at a time. So it was a, quite a lengthy spectacle. And they had armed guards mingling among us. And if they caught anyone, either closing their eyes or turning their head away, they would rifle bat us and threaten us that unless we kept our eyes on this gruesome spectacle, we might be the next ones to hang out there. That is my one enduring memory. One of these eight people was an 18 year old youngster who I had befriended. I was helpless, there was nothing I could do to save him. Shortly after this spectacle, we were packed into trains again and moved to yet another camp. Incidentally, during these journeys in cattle trucks, we were never ever given any food, no water, no matter whether it took one day or four days, made no difference. And sometimes we were given a bucket for sanitary needs, and sometimes not even a bucket. People fainted, people died, the bodies just lay around us. The end you, uh, Manfred, can you skip? Um, can you skip TV? to the time of liberation? Um, because we're a I, little I, bit. I would just like to time. tell you. I would like to tell you about this extraordinary experience in Burgraben, and then I will go on to the liberation. This camp we arrived at was a smallish camp called Burgraben. Now, in each camp, we had to assemble every morning, and an SS officer would move slowly along holding a list and each one of us would have to shout out our number and he would tick and then move on and on. When he was still some distance away from me, I caught his glance and I could see that he repeatedly glanced at me and I began to feel quite uneasy remembering 
my mother's uh, advice, try not to be noticed, I began to feel that I, I had been noticed. And indeed, as he came closer, it, I became sure of it. Mm. I was as nervous as can be. When he reached me and I called out my number, he ticked it and he said to me, when everyone else is dismissed, I want you to stay. By now I trembled. Everyone was dismissed eventually and he took his time, but he came back, looked me up and down and he said, I've decided to appoint you as my Batman, my, in, in effect, my personal slave, follow me. And he took me to his um, um, barrack, where there were sort of little self-contained apartments. He was a high-ranking SS officer who was entitled to decent accommodation. So he took me into the studio flat and he gave me a long list of jobs I had to do, like making his bed, wash and clear his breakfast things, um, clear out the place, brush every single one of his numerous uniforms, polish every one of his many pairs of boots, wash the floor, a long list which kept me busy. And then he left me to it. Of, co of course, I remembered my mother's uh, advice, do everything as perfect as you can. So his boots sparkled, there was not a speck of dust on any of his uniform, but I did all this trembling because had I displeased him in any way, or was just in a bad mood, there was nothing to stop him pulling out his revolver and uh, seeing me off. There would have been absolutely no consequence for him because Jewish life was worthless. Officers certainly had that the authority wouldn't have to give any account or reason for doing what they did. Fortunately, we were in this camp for just three weeks and each day was ongoing torture for me. I survived. Then we were packed into cattle trucks again, and this time we were transported to Stuttov. This was the end of 1944. Stuttov had by now changed from being just a brutal camp to being a mini Auschwitz. When Stuttov was built, it did not have a gas chamber or crematorium. That was built only a year or so before the period I'm speaking about, when the camp was greatly enlarged, it was tripled in size. And at the same time, they built a gas chamber and a crematorium into the camp. And by now, tra track load, train loads of Jews arrived in Stuttgart from the east. As the Allies advanced, the Nazis tried to empty all these telltale camps in the east in order not to allow uh, live inmates to fall into allied hands to talk about the atrocities they had to endure. So instead they tried to empty and send all these people who they hadn't murdered yet to camps which had mass murder facilities and Stuttgart was one. So trainloads of Jews began arriving. And quite incredibly, I cannot explain why, some train loads of Jews were sent straight to the gas chamber, did not even into the camp, straight to the gas chamber and lost their lives and then took one to the crematorium. And okay. other train loads were meticulously registered and sent into the camp. By meticulous, Can you show I mean, the slide? Can you show the slide to the crematorium? Yeah. So we suffered in Stuttgart for um, months until in April, on the 26th of April, 1946, uh, 45, a group of us, quite a large group of men, men and women were separated in Stuttgart, of course. There was a women's camp adjoining ours, separated by a barbed wire fence. And Stuttgart had an electric fence surrounding us as well as a, a, an ordinary fence and in addition there were sort of guard towers um, with armed guards on them that the, the, the nazis had an obsession of, of not permitting anyone to escape although they were murdering people by, by the million uh, you weren't if anyone escaped there were severe consequences excuse me manfred i think there's a slide of uh 
the yes. crematorium, uh, the, um, of Stutthof. Melissa, okay. if you could show that yes. slide. I, I can show you a rather gruesome slide of um, what the crematorium oven looks like. This was a series of crematorium ovens. Incidentally, they built the crematorium with ovens inside, but then they were murdering so many people that they couldn't cope. So some of these ovens were built outside in the open. Oh, and I even see. then they couldn't burn sufficient bodies quickly enough. So any excess bodies were just piled up in the open, and when the pile was large enough, they would sprinkle some paraffin on it and set it alight to burn out in the open. That's that's how people were killed. Can you go, can you show the map again, uh, Melissa? That, you can go back is, to the map that we can understand the liberation the last few weeks. Okay, if you can please show the next slide, please. It's one which I'd like you to look at carefully. This photo, I'm told, was taken by a Russian soldier when Stutthof was liberated. And this is an enormous pile of shoes. We're talking about tens, hundreds of thousands of people being murdered. These are figures which I found, although I'm, I'm an insider, it, it's difficult to put any meaning to such figures with lots of zeros at the end. I would like you to look at that pile of shoes and just imagine that each pair of shoes belonged to a person who lost their lives in the gas chamber because before people entered the gas chamber, they had to take off their shoes and throw them on a pile. And that is the pile of shoes that have grown. This may help you to do try to understand the magnitude of what we are talking about. That, that, that's my reason for, for including it. Yes. I think, well, could you go back no, to the map because we I, need the I, map I will, to understand. I'll tell you about our liberation. As I said, a group of us was put, taken aside and under armed guards, each one of us being given a chunk of bread as we were marched out of the camp of Stutthof. The same thing happened in the ladies' camp. A group of ladies were assembled, also under armed guard. And as we left the camp, the two columns began to merge. Of course, my first thought was, where's my mother? Is she one of those marching or is she left behind in the camp? Likewise, she didn't know whether I was marching or had also been left behind. So I began sort of bending my way through the columns, searching for my mother. I don't know how long it took. My mother, of course, had the same idea and began searching for me. And to our mutual delight, eventually we found each other. We had no idea what our fate would be, or what was ahead of us, but at least we would share it. We would be together. And in this manner, we marched until we reached um, a small um, harbor. We were, mar we were marched, I know now, sort of along the coastline towards Gdansk. But before Gdansk, we reached a very small harbor and there were four barges lined up and they pushed the four, so four small columns, divided us into four columns, and each one into one of these barges. They weren't made for that, and of course not for that number of people, as each one of us was taken down, right down into the barrel of the barge. There were no internal divisions. It was just the hull of the ship, and the internal part was all one. We had to sit down, we had to open our legs wide so that the next person could sit close to us, that their back would touch your chest. And in that manner, like fish in a sardine tin, um, that they piled us into the barge. Then four tugs appeared. Each one coupled themselves to one of these barges. These tugs were manned by SS teams and they began towing us to sea. After a few hours, our barge stopped and the SS officer appeared at the top of the barge. There was a gangway going round the 
barge, the outside of the barge. He looked down and he fastened onto one of us down there and said, I want that person brought up. And he had selected the number of men to whom he said, you're now under my command. Do exactly as I say. But he said, bring this person up, man or woman. They had to be dragged up onto the deck, struggling, screaming, to no avail. And once they were up on deck, of course, they were out of our sight, but we could hear screaming followed by a splash. They were screaming because they were being thrown life into the sea to drown. And then he selected number two, number three, number four. This went on for a while until around 20 to 30 people had been selected and each one of them, without Rahmanas, dragged up, thrown into the sea. Then he would disappear and we would continue our journey. On every second morning, the tags would uncouple themselves and collectively that they would go off. And after a while, they would return. We thought they had gone maybe to refuel because on one of these mornings, when he selected his victims, he said with a smirk on his face, we're using too much fuel towing you, we have to lighten the load. That's why he selected his victims to, to drown them. Well, on day six, the tugs went off again. And unlike previous occasions, they did not return after the usual time. We were left mid-sea. We had no idea where we were. We, we couldn't see outside. We couldn't move. We were stuck in this line with people leaning against us front and back. And eventually, um, some members of our group, who were not all Jewish, I told you that there were um, prisoners of war, Poles who were fighting as partisans and had been caught, and German anti-Nazis. There was, there was a mishmash of us there, the thousand on our um, barge, were part of this collection. And the prisoners of war, I know now, but I didn't know then, were fed a much better diet in the camp. Not a starvation diet. I think the International Red Cross must have intervened on their behalf. And they were still physically in, in fairly good shape. So a group of them clambered up on deck and the message came down that we are quite close to shore, only a few hundred meters from shore at, at sea, but uh, we could see the land. And this group of um, prisoners of war um, decided to do something quite incredible. They managed to pluck off some planks of wood and formed themselves into a rowing team around the outside of the barge and began rowing in unison to try and move the barge towards shore. Of course, it was an impossibility, but we didn't see any of this, but the messages kept coming down. Eventually, the message came down that the barge had responded, it had turned facing shore, and it was beginning to creep ever, ever so slowly towards shore. They paddled in this way until they were utterly exhausted. But by then, other people had been encouraged and they came up and took their turn. All day long, there were teams rowing in this manner, just to a few hundred meters. And eventually, night fell. They kept on rowing through the night. And shortly before dawn, we could feel a shudder. The barge had run aground. So anyone who still had an ounce of strength began clambering up on deck. And quite a number of people were so exhausted. We had been on these barges for six days. Not a drop of water had passed our lips. No food, apart from the chunk of bread we had been given when we left Stuttgart, we'd had nothing for six days now. This was day seven, actually. Um, so many people were so utterly physically and mentally exhausted that it didn't mean anything to them, but they were past living or wanting to stay alive. They just sat passively. Some, including my mother, thank God, and she encouraged me, the two of us, scrambled up onto deck. It was quite a jump into the water, but 
with, with her encouragement, the two of us, and quite a few other people, but probably less than half of the people on, on board um, jumped right to shore, and it was a pitch dark night. There was absolutely no sign of habitation. All we could see was a vast expanse of sandy shore. We had no idea whether to run, stay where we are, run forward, right, left, which way was safe, we didn't know. And while people were having this, this discussion, I recall my mother and I um, concentrated on finding some bits of seaweed, which we could just chew and get something into our empty tummies. And while all this was going on, lo and behold, the tugs containing DSS teams had returned. And they, of course, were livid at the site that met them. And they divided into two teams. One clambered onto our barge, which we had vacated, of course, but many had left, been left behind. And they began shooting. We heard a lot of shooting. We couldn't see what happened, but we knew that what was happening, and it has since been, of course, um, confirmed that everyone who was left on the barge was shot by them. A second smaller group came ashore and began rounding us up. Daylight was just beginning to break. And as we heard all the shooting, as they rounded us up, we were convinced that uh, we would be the next lot to be shot. But no, it didn't happen. They lined us up into a column and began marching us again. Daylight was returning. Um, I, I will have to, to condense our liberation and miss out one incident, which is not really relevant. We have been marching like this for a good while, and a lot of military traffic kept passing us, but that was of no interest to us. It was a major road, with marching along, traffic passing by. Eventually, a tank column came into sight. Um, which came towards us. And as it came near, suddenly a shout went up from our column. Look, our guards, they, they, they've, they've turned and run, they, they've run for their lives. And they left us unguarded. They had spotted before we did that this was an allied tank column. It was a column of British tanks. And as they came closer, the guards recognized them and instead of shooting Jews who struggled behind, who were mercilessly shot moments earlier, they now turned and run for their lives. And that tank column, incredibly, did not stop. They were just rolled past us. They must have had orders to reach some other destination. And just by passing us, by happening to take the same road as we were marching on, they had liberated us. We now had no guards, but we had no idea where we were what to do next. And while people were sort of confused and tried to think, what, what, what can we do? Truckloads of British soldiers appeared. They stopped. They began caring for us, told us to sit down. And they either had with them or they called out truckloads full of food. They opened the rear of the trucks and handed out food indiscriminately, which was not the right thing to do because stomachs which have had nothing but dry bread and watery soup for years, couldn't cope with corned beef and uh, butter and cheese and so on. So some people suffered and one or two people actually lost their lives. But we grabbed what we could because our mentality was, you didn't know what tomorrow would bring, so we had to lay in stocks. And when we had rested for a while, they so not marched us, but walked us gently into a nearby town called Neustadt. And this really, it didn't then, but it reminds me in retrospect of one fact equivalent to the Megillah. In that town, that there was a huge German army compound. It was a naval training school. Neustadt was a town which bordered onto the um, Baltic Sea. And this large German camp was a training camp for, for Nazi uh, Navy. All the inmates, the German inmates, had been taken away as prisoners of war. And we were housed 
in the accommodation which had been occupied by the, these Nazi soldiers. The previous night, some Nazi soldier had slept in the bed which I was sleeping in the following night. But that so, was to me so that the height of yeah. irony. And they, they began caring for us. Um, nurses kept coming around, looking at people to see whether they needed treatment. So my mother caught typhoid, didn't call, but uh, it became apparent she probably had it before, but she became ill with typhoid. She was taken to hospital. I was bereft. And of course, every morning I walked to hospital, spent all day with her until on day three or four, I fainted on the way and I woke up in a hospital bed. I had also caught typhus, so both of us were now there. While I was in hospital, they discovered that I had also suffered from TB. So I had other treatment as well, and I stayed in hospital for quite a while. Eventually, um, I was released, but they told me I was not fit to live on my own. I was sent to a convalescent home. And because I was still considered a child, my mother was allowed to accompany me. We were interviewed by a welfare officer who asked us whether we had any close relative with whom we wanted to be reunited. Of course, he gave details of my father. We had no idea of where he was, but gave his name, date of birth, place of birth. We didn't know where. And he, did the welfare officer said, don't worry, we will find him. And in London, at the same time, the chief rabbi's office opened a special office for refugees who were searching for the families they had left behind. So my father, of course, gave them details of us. He was searching for us. And we were trying to get in touch with him. Well, it was in pre-computer days. It took quite a long time, about three months or so, before they matched the two inquiries. And my father was told, that most of his family had survived, but one son had been murdered. He was not allowed to come to see us because Germany was still a war zone. We couldn't phone each other because there were no telephones available, but he was allowed to um, write letters to us and eventually also to send us parcels. So in an early letter, he enclosed a tiny passport-sized photo of my little brother, whose image you saw earlier, because we had lost everything. And in his first parcel, he sent a pair of tefillin and, and a siddha for me. Although I'd had my bar mitzvah, I, I'd never put on tefillin because the, there were no tefillin around to give me. Um, of course, my father didn't know. Uh, my father, as I said, came from a very from home. And despite his experiences, the agony of not knowing the fate of his family for six years, his faith was unshaken. He was a member of Shu, he went to Shiorim, um, and he applied for us to join him. It took more than a year. No one told us to leave the convalescent home, so we stayed there until we were ready to come to the UK. Excuse he, me. Uh, uh, um... Manfred, that brings us to the, the elephant in the room, faith and observance after the Shoah. Sorry? My... That brings us to the elephant in the room, which is the faith, observance, the almighty after the Shoah. How do you relate to that? I didn't understand. Faith, faith and faith. observance in the well, Shoah. I How see. You... Well, it was a bittersweet reunion with my father, as you will realize, because my we were not a complete family any longer. But as I said, my father's faith had not been shaken. And of course, um, he began taking me to shul, although I had the, sort of the educational age of a nine-year-old. Uh, I didn't know very much about Jewish practices. And I knew what an eight-year, nine-year-old boy will know. And the, although it was a Jewish school, it, it was not what you would consider here to be sort of Haredi school, it, it um, taught primarily the, the children of the German Jewish uh, population of Kassel. So it was sort of mildly um, religious. So my, my knowledge was not 
what you would expect a nine-year-old to know now. So I, of course, was happy to be with my father. I was incredibly lucky, almost unique, in being a teenage survivor who had both parents alive. I had a, a home with caring parents. So I began going to shul with my father. He began teaching me from, from the Siddha, um, you know, the Tefillas, we would say, because I, I really didn't know. Um, but once I began acquiring some knowledge, as I matured, I really began to wonder, well, what, what is all this about? In our prayers, we call the Almighty a just God who remembers goodness, rewards goodness, whose patience is inexhaustible. How, how can I relate to a God who supposedly possesses these qualities, how could such a God allow these things to happen to us? I could not relate in any way. I couldn't break my father's heart. Outwardly, ostensibly, I put on my tefillin as he had taught me. I went through the prayers, but it really did not mean very much to me. It, it was not a Jew praying. Um, I just, as I said, could, could not accept that the God who I'm praying to could allow this to happen. Well, as I matured, I began to realize slowly but surely that I, I was wrong in, in thinking that there probably is no God. This is all a fairy tale because I began to realize that we actually experience miracles daily. I began to learn about birth. Um, as I looked around at the sky and I began to, to read and, and know what, what, what goes on up there with the millions, billions of stars. Um, how does earth, a food grow out of the earth? The seasons change. The temperature never gets too hot or too cold for us. And I found out that if the sun had been any other distance from Earth, so all this I felt could not happen by chance. That, that there must be something guiding this this world. I, I began reading about um, what's his name, the, 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 the naturist Charles Charles. Don't we all right, and I thought that man doesn't know what he's talking about. Of, of course, there are miracles, <coughs> but I still couldn't understand, okay, that there is a God. There's a God who's looked after us. I began to, to read about the um, miracles that happened to Jewish people in history and how God cared for us ongoingly. But what happened there? What went wrong? I could not understand still. But Eventually, I came across a pasuk in the Torah, and in it, I think it's somewhere in Bayitro, Moshe Rabbeinu pleads with the Almighty to give him some insight into the, the way God relates to us. And God's reply to Moshe Rabbeinu was, no, my ways are not your ways. No man who sees my face, in other words, man, no man who understands me can live. So that is out. I, I cannot grant your request. And that led me to believe that, like Moshe Rabbeinu, we are finite beings. And God has given us a finite mind. And our minds can analyze and interpret things up to a certain level. But something that happens beyond that level is beyond our understanding and reasoning. And therefore, we, we cannot reason about what happened to us. And if God does not give us the power to reason with it, it must be because God does not want us to understand. And I began to realize that was the meaning of faith. If we could understand the way God works, we would not need faith. But the way 
God presents himself to us, we do need faith in order to become believing and devout Jews. And since then, I have done my best to live my life in the manner of a faithful and devout Jew. I possibly could have done better, but I, I, I did my best. Possibly that <laughs> phrase could have done better applies to people who had not, not had my experience could also have done better. That's very that, moving. That is, that is how can we end, uh, Maverick, can we end with something uh, cheerful like the prince and princess whom you accompanied to Stutthof? Can you explain uh, briefly how that happened and Buckingham yes. Palace? Well, once I came to England, I began to learn English and primarily at my mother's um, influence. In fact, there was disagreement between my parents concerning me. My father, I told you, came from a very religious home and he wanted me to attend yeshiva. My mother said, look, he's had no education since the age of nine. He, he must be able to live in this world. He needs to brush up on his um, secular education. And this was a serious disagreement between my parents. I, of course, because of my experiences, was much closer to my mother than to my father. My father was a stranger to me when we met. We established a relationship, but it was never equivalent to my relationship with my mother, as you probably can understand. Um, and of course, I sided with my mother. But, and indeed, my, although my parents were paupers, my, my father was initially arrested as a potential enemy alien. And then he was given the choice of joining the British army, which he did. Eventually he was released, invalided out of the army. But because he was an alien, he had to take work only with the agreement of the home office. And it had to be work which helped the British war effort. Well, all the factories worked six days a week. My father was strictly shown a Shabbos and could not work on Shabbat. So he had great difficulty finding work. Eventually he found there was a, a from smallish building firm who refurbished bomb damaged how homes and they did not work on Shabbos. So although he was nothing of the kind, he claimed to be a painter. He was a businessman before. Um, and because they were so short of men, they accepted his word for it and accepted him as a painter. He told me he sort of played being slow and whatever he saw the painters do, he copied. So he got away and he learned and he worked for them till the end of the war, earning a pittance. So he literally was a pauper when we came over. He was still not, not working as a painter any longer, but he had no real panosu. But nevertheless, at my mother's insistence, they deprived themselves of many necessities to pay for some private education for me. I was too old to go to school, past school leaving age, so it had to be done privately. In addition, the children of some friends my parents had made volunteered and gave me some tuition. Also, um, there was a Jewish school. I, I have not got time to go into details, but one Rav and one secular teacher volunteered to take me under their wing and I would go to the Rav's home. We lived in the ghetto in Stamford Hill in North London and he lived very close to us. Every Shabbat afternoon I was invited to come to him, to his home, and we would learn, so simple learning to where I'd left off. He sort of tried to raise my level. And the secular teacher um, also asked me to come to his home and would give me some private tuition and he would give me simple books to read. When I'd read a book, I would return it and he'd give me another. So with, with help from all these directions, um, I, I caught up on some of my mislearning. There's still huge gaps, but um, it was more crumbing than learning. But in this manner, <laughs> eventually, I managed to reach a level that was accepted by university, and, and I actually managed to get um, an engineering degree in what was 
then called light engineering. Nowadays, it's called electronics. Electronics was in its infancy then, and that is how I began earning my living. Can, can you skip then, to the? Uh, uh, may I pray, can you skip to the uh, to the return to Stutthof with the prince and princess? Yes. Okay. Well, soon after I came to this country and I had reached this level, <clears throat> um, my parents, of course, wanted me to get married. I'm being an only son now, I didn't want to get married until I, as was the custom then, until I could earn Parnosa. And it took me years to, to, to reach that level. So at one point, I, I wanted to become an electrician, but I found it was too uh, sort of that mundane, not sufficiently stimulating. That's why I went into university then. But I decided to look forward and have a positive life. Even when I got married, I wanted my children to have a normal life, not being a lot of sort of children of a survivor, because I began to realize that many survivors could not return to normality. And in this manner, I decided never to set foot in Germany again, never to go back to any of the camps I have been in. And eventually I married a wonderful lady. I can look anyone in the eye and tell them a girl in a million I married. And thank God, I still bless the day when she said yes to me. We had children, um, we had grandchildren already. Then one day, after I began public speaking, there is an organization in London called the Holocaust Memorial Trust. And I was put on the panel of speakers for them. If schools wanted to hear a survivor's testimony, they would contact this organization and they would <clears throat> in turn contact one of their survivors on the speakers panel and send them to that school. Well, <clears throat> one day in, in 2017, the Holocaust Educational Trust was contacted by representatives of Prince William and Princess Kate. And they were sent on a diplomatic visit to Germany and Poland, about the other way around, Poland and Germany. And I found out later, after I met the Royals, that they were interested in the Holocaust. And before going back to Poland and Germany, they had done a lot of reading relating to the Holocaust, but they still felt that they weren't really informed. So they contacted this um, educational trust and said, we would like to visit um, a concentration camp while we are on this diplomatic visit. Their itinerary had already been fixed at that point. And they found that the concentration camp of Stutthof was closest to their itinerary. I think it only meant a detour of 50 kilometers or so. So that camp was chosen as the one they would visit. And then they expressed a wish to meet a couple of Jewish survivors who had been in the camp. And apparently the um, educational trust had very few survivors. They knew my story and they knew I had been in Stuttgart twice. So they contacted me and they did it in a very strange way. They contacted me one day and said, um, we are at the moment sworn to secrecy, but we would like you to reserve the 17th and 18th of July. Don't make any commitments. We'll be in touch with you again. Then they contacted me a second time and said, well, there's some high ranking diplomats coming and they would like to greet you, to meet you. And so it went on. I had several phone calls, each time a little closer until eventually, not too long before the date we were traveling, they told us who we were meeting, that it was Prince William and Princess Kate. And they also selected a friend of mine who had also been to Stuttgart, Ziggy Schipper. I don't know whether you've ever heard of him. Um, and um, I agonized before I could accept to return to this camp, which was the most brutal of all the camps I'd been in. Eventually I decided I had to face it and I agreed. And we went to Stuttgart. Um, they did something really clever. Stutthof 
um, was a huge camp at the end. It contained more than 50,000 Jews, although it was designed to house 25,000, which was my bed. When we were there, we had to sleep two or three in a bunk bed. It was so overcrowded. But now we were taken back. They took us back a day early. Stutthof, um, post-war, was an abandoned concentration camp. Anyone could walk in. And apparently there was such poverty in Poland that Poles just went in and helped themselves to whatever they found. And slowly but surely they dismantled the barracks, which were wooden built. They took the wood as firewood to heat their homes. And two thirds of the camp was dismantled, disappeared. When the Polish government suddenly realized that they had a treasure on their hands there and they uh, protected what remained of the camp and um, began publicizing it as a concentration camp. So now they have turned up about six or seven barracks of the old original barracks left in Stutthof. Initially, there must have been 50, 60, 80% of the camp had gone. And they turned these walkthrough barracks into a walkthrough museum. They sort of formed different scenarios, not individual items, one showed what the barracks looked like by placing the original three tier bunk beds at the same distance apart so that you could just shuffle in. You know, if you took a deep breath, you, you were caught between the back. Um, so that they demonstrated these. They had one showing the different types of these convict garments, which are handed out to us, and so on. Um, and they took us, the survivors, together with everyone else who'd come along. There was a, a staff of um, about eight people or so from the Educational Trust who came along. And <clears throat> they took us through this museum just for a practice run. In case we were emotionally overcome, we could get it out of our system now before we met the royal couple the following day. So this is what we did. And in fact, it was quite overwhelming. And then they took us to Gdansk. We spent the night in a hotel. The next morning we came back and um, they gave us the routine that we be taking the royal couple through various um, ex exhibits. And to my amazement, I did not know before I came to Stutthof, the gas chamber and the crematorium survived perfectly intact. The Nazis, as a rule, in all these mass um, ex uh, murder camps, they blew up the gas chamber and the crematorium before they evacuated the camp so that the Nazis, uh, the, the allies, um, sh shouldn't see what had happened. In Stutthof, they also attempted to do it. Apparently, they laid dynamite around these two buildings, but instead of blowing it up there and then, they didn't want to get their uniforms dirty, so they, they put it on a timer to explode after they had evacuated the camp, just days before the end of the war. And the timer misfunctioned, and it blew up only a small hole into the uh, crematorium. The rest was totally undamaged. So that is how they survived intact. And we were able to show the royal couple not only the museum, but they also walked, the, the, the gas chamber had a gate on it. We could look inside, but couldn't go in, but we could walk into the crematorium. And I can show you actually, if you show the next slide. So, which do you want to see? Here? No, this is the first one you've gone to. No, I, I will. Number I eight. Number, no, number eight. This. Number eight. Yeah. Number eight or nine? Oh, here is we it, are. This is eight? it. Yes. This is the one I asked you for. Oh, it's enough. No, one if you go one. back to that one. No, you passed it. And again, back again. And again. 
This is that, uh, yes, you have it, that's it. This is our meeting with Prince William and Princess Kate. Well, you recognize the two tall ones and um, with the walking stick, that is I, and the other one is my friend, Ziggy Schipper. Incident, the reason I asked for it now, that gray building in the left photograph is the crematorium building. You'll see the tall chimney at the back there, at the rear. Mm. That, that is where they processed Jewish bodies. So we, we had roughly one hour with the royal couple, and we were told that there'd be no one listening in. This was purely between um, the four of us. They could ask any questions they wanted, what life was really like. They asked us where we'd been before we came to Stuttgart. They asked about our families, what had happened, whether we still had family with us. Really, as of um, piercing questions. And it was at that point that Princess Kate, we sort of split up. I spoke mainly to Princess Kate and Siggy mainly to Prince William because we walked on a narrow path. We couldn't walk all abreast. We had to divide into two lots. So that, that's how we walked the length of the camp. And um, Princess Kate, first of all, she, she was um, emotionally quite affected. She walked through a display where she didn't see this huge mound of shoes, but the replica, a much smaller mound of shoes, with an explanatory would be explained that the original mound had been 10 times that size, that each pair represented someone who had to walk into the gas chamber. She actually wiped her eyes more than once. She, she, she felt it, it penetrated her soul. And she also told me that they had done a fair bit of Holocaust related reading, but they, she told me they still were not prepared for what they saw in Stuttgart. And I can assure you that the museum they walked through was all highly sanitized. It, it bore a pale resemblance to what Stuttgart was like back in 1944 when we were there. But that, that was our contact with royalty which, of course, I wouldn't dream about in my wildest dreams. And we made an impact on them because I have met the world, this young royal couple twice more since, once face to face and once on Zoom. And the most recent one was on Zoom. Um, at the end of just the, the last annual um, event to commemorate the Holocaust in, in England, it is on the 27th of January, because that was the date Auschwitz was liberated, so they fixed that as the secular um, Holocaust Memorial Day. And Prince Charles and his wife were guests of honor at this event. And I, of course, was there. I was being given an honor to light one of the six candles which will lit. Uh, I think that's in the next slide. I think there's a slide yeah, yeah, of that. William, no, William and Kate. Yes, William and Kate yeah. were there. And we were told at the end of the meeting, uh, some 25 or 30 or so of us were told to go into an adjoining room and wait there. And Prince William and Princess Kate would enter that room and would have a chat with us. And indeed they did. And they spoke it, with us individually, with each one. And each one in turn, as they came up to me, recognized me and greeted me as Manfred. And she told me that she clearly remembered our conversations there. It had made a real impact on them. Can you see the next slide? Yes. So no, that was my contact with royalty. Then this royal couple left Stuttgart, they were asked to leave a message in the VIP visitors book. And this was the message which they penned into the book. And I'd like you to read it because it really reflects their feeling. And I think we as a Jewish community have reason to be grateful of the way that they feel about us. You can probably read it. 
the shattering, this shattering visit has rendered us, has reminded us of the horrendous murder of six million Jews drawn from across the whole of Europe who died in the abominable Holocaust. All of us have an overwhelming responsibility to make sure that we learn the lessons and that the horror of what happened is never forgotten and never repeated. And you can see it's signed William and Catherine. So they really, um, now th th this may surprise you, most of you probably know all about this. Um, I had had no, no regular contact with royalty until in December, 2020, Firstly, I, I was awarded in the Queen's Honours List um, a BEM, a British Empire Medal, for services I rendered to remembrance or ed education related to the Holocaust and remembrance of the Holocaust. <clears throat> there was an appointment for the medal to be presented to me by a member of royalty, but that didn't take place because of COVID, and eventually it was sent to me by post. Um, in December 2020, I had a telephone call from someone who introduced himself as Lord Roslin, the master of the household of Prince Charles. And he told me, he said it was in strict conf confidence that he was speaking to me, that Prince Charles was developing a project to have seven Holocaust camp survivors painted by accomplished artists and to use these seven portraits as a means of commemorating the memory of the six million and the memory of the Holocaust. These paintings would be paid for by Prince Charles and they would become the property of the Royal Art Collection. And he told me that Prince Charles I don't possibly with help or advice, had selected seven survivors, and he was happy to tell me that I was one of the seven who had been selected. And believe it or not, he phoned to ask my permission uh, to seek my agreement to be painted in this manner. Of course, it, it took me a fraction of a second to decide, and uh, I happily gave my permission I was not told my artist that was organized by Prince Charles. Eventually I was given the name and telephone number of my artist. We contacted each other because of COVID restrictions, we were not allowed to meet. So she began painting me in the same manner that you see me today on Zoom. I sat in front of a laptop in our dining room and she sat in front of a laptop in her studio, which was more than a hundred miles away. Eventually, months later, after we began this, there was a whole series of contacts via Zoom for, for the painting. And of course, I had to wear the same outfit each time. Um, but um, eventually, the restrictions eased a little and she was allowed to come to our home but only um, into the garden, not into the house. So we sat, she bought an easel and she began painting me in the garden. And the BBC got to know about this and they actually sent a team and, and photographed that part of that event, which was included in the film, which probably quite a number of you may have seen. It was screened on BBC Two on the 27th of January this year, just a, a few weeks ago. Um, in in, in we this manner, seven portraits were painted and eventually we all kept our promise of, of confidence, kept it all quiet. Eventually um, we were contacted by Lord Rosalind again. We had ongoing contact with him um, that he, Prince Charles made the decisions and Lord Rosalind, his master of the household, he, he was the hands-on man, he actually saw it through. So we were invited to come to Buckingham Palace on the 24th of January, 
with the taking into a large hall, one by one, each of us was permitted to bring five family members, five guests, and the artist was permitted to bring just one guest. So there were seven of us for each portrait, no, eight. Five family member plus I would be six, and the painter, the painter and her husband, so it would be eight. So eight at a time, we were taken into the hall, and there was a BBC photographer to film our reaction when we had our first look at, at our portrait. I had not had a glimpse of it while it was being painted. And then eventually, the seven lots were taken in in seven stages. Each one was filmed for their reaction. Eventually, Prince Charles and uh, his wife, uh, the Duchess of Cornwall, Camilla, entered. And they split into two. One went round the hall clockwise, speaking to each one group, and the other anti-clockwise. And eventually, um, Prince Charles so much enjoyed it that they stayed on after that, and they went around sort of together to each one of us and had chats with us. And they were quite happy to be photographed with me, as you can see. So I've had the rare and uh, undreamt of privilege of having met two men who will in turn become kings of England. Yeah, one more picture. Um, one more. Yes, please, you, you may show one more. This. See, this is when he came around on his own. You can see my portrait in the background there on the left. And this is how Prince Charles quite informally chatted with each one of us. You can see the corner of Shari's little red hat she was wearing and facing us is one of our sons. He's facing us head on, our mm -hmm. son Svi. And he spoke to our boys individually as well. Very, very informal, easygoing. He seemed to have had a, a good time chatting with, with all of us and stayed much longer than anticipated. And that was my second undreamt of experience. Mm -hmm. uh, we're going to have to bring he this. Um... My story in a nutshell. Yeah. I'm sorry, I overrun the time allotted to it. So this is your family here? Yes, that this is um, our family. Um, you'll see me next. So Shari and I are to, to the left of the portrait. Next to Shari is my artist, Clara Drummond, a very talented young lady. Next to her is our son, David, our before. And on the left are the other three sons in age order, Svi, Arya, and Rafi. So our four sons are David, Svi, Arya, and Rafi. And my one and only wife, Shari. Okay. This, we want to thank you, Manfred. We want to remind people that this conversation can be viewed next week. It was recorded on the www.machul.org website. And uh, before we close, the CORE Library has a birthday gift for you. You were 92 years old on Sunday, your Hebrew birthday. I'd may have a stream. Yes. So we're going to present you with a little gift oh. as a gesture of our thanks. Gosh. Yes. You want to catch my expression yet again? <laughs> uh, Can you hold it up to the, to the camera? Hold it. Hold it it's, it's a Havdalah candle made by people with disabilities in Israel. Yes, it's a Havdalah candle and it's made by people with disabilities. Uh, and with this gesture, we wish you a happy birthday and thank you for the most meaningful conversation. Thank you so, Thank so you. much. Yes, if there are questions, I don't know, people could stay on a little bit. I think officially we could close. Uh, is there any urgent question? Muted. Oh, I'm muted. Um, 
just to say that any any time I hear Manfred, it just brings tears to the eyes and appreciate the fact that we didn't have to suffer as he did. Thank you, Hazel. Yeah, can I can I say can you can you please um, broadcast or put on put on the, the uh, YouTube details uh, uh, of the, how we can re record this and see it again and again? Can you l let us have the details um, on YouTube or, or in, uh, on? It's it's uh, look uh, look in the chat. Do you see the chat? Uh, yeah. Uh huh www.maxshul.org okay well it'll be there and it's under videos there's a video category it'll be there next week oh fine okay that's good thank you very much indeed thanks for asking wonderful. yeah I, I, I would like to ask a very quick question to manfred himself manfred you go to schools and you and you speak about all of this uh, are you limited in time are you allowed to show pictures how how do you present it to them? And I also believe that you speak to businessmen. You have um, so much lecturing to do. How do you fit it all into your lifetime? Yeah. As, 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 a, as a matter of fact, uh, this afternoon um, at 7 p.m. Israel time, <clears throat> I'm giving a, a testimony talk to the USA, to wow. a dis distinguished firm of lawyers um, who have sort of an international practice and they've chosen that time because it suits both the UK and the US. In yeah. the US, apparently, it's um, morning, which is convenient. And in the UK, where it will also be shown, it's, I think, lunchtime that people can watch during their lunch break. And they'll record it and send it to their other branches for whom the time is not convenient. So, yeah, yes, I, I do speak to um, communities, to Jewish communities, to, to um, secular communities as well. Um, yeah. Yes. In fact, yeah, yesterday I had belated birthday wishes as a result of having spoken to the head office of uh, NatWest Bank in London some time <laughs> ago. That they found out a bit late about my birthday and uh, sent me belated birthday wishes. Having got to know me by means of a talk. Uh, Manifred, what kind of questions do they ask you? I mean, uh, I, I did a lot of work with non-Jewish people, but not on this subject. Well, how, how do they react to you? One question which I'm asked very frequently was one that uh, Shira asked me, what about faith? How, how, how could you keep your faith after your experiences? Or how did you gain or regain your faith? But a question to that effect. People ask all sorts of things. Believe it or not, that the very first time I spoke in our shul, and it was to, to an informed audience, and a young man who appeared to be a yeshiva bocha, at the end of the talk, he asked me, what did you do on Shabbos? <laughs> after, after I'd said, we worked seven days a week. And yeah. he asked me, what did you do on Shabbos? But um, normally I get sensible questions from uh, the, the school uh, youngsters. But you usually sort of mixed schools, of course. As a rule, they're grammar, grammar schools. I speak to the, uh, probably the year below A level, right yeah. up to the top, to the, these few classes. Yeah. In Jewish schools, um, that they usually allow younger people from age 12 on oh. to listen to me. Um, but the, the, the questions range over uh, huge. Um, the different things make different impacts. Mm -hmm. um, I, I, I get messages from, from youngsters saying, I couldn't stop crying. The most powerful image I saw was that mount of shoes. Mm -hmm. That really made me aware of, of the tragedy of, of the Jewish people. Until then, I couldn't really absorb the numbers. Mm -hmm. that, that's one reason I keep that image yeah. showed in, in every talk because it does help people maybe not everyone but many people find it meaningful so that, that, that's one um, some want to know how, how I kept in touch with my mother yeah. and I have to say miraculously because we had absolutely no input into this 
whenever we were transferred from one camp to another, yeah. both of us were included. The first time from Riga to the next camp called Prechu, all three of us were included, including my younger brother, but he was murdered in Prechu. From then on, it was just the two of us. Yeah. Although we were in six different locations, each time I was selected to be moved. My mother, who was not with me, but she was in the women's camp, and yeah. they were selected quite independently. She, she was also selected, so it, it, the odds of that happening are probably astronomically high. Yes. It, it happened to us each time, including the death march. As I explained, I have no idea whether my mother was marching or whether she was left behind in Stutter. And we, we found each other independently. Both of us had been selected yet again. And we yes. were liberated together, of course. Yeah, that was wonderful. Thank you, Manfred. Thank you. So may I ask a quick question, um, Manfred? Yes, of course. Uh, yeah, all we're right. really Thank you. running out of time for questions. Ah, okay, so I'll, I'll, I'll leave it. I'll leave it. Oh, okay. okay. Oh. May, I just, may I just say something, please, to Manfred? Uh, Manfred, your, your story has made a great impression on us and really has given us faith for the future. Thank you so much. It was a wonderful, wonderful afternoon with you. Yes. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, thank you everyone for coming. Thank you, Manfred. And thank you and have a good day. <laughs>